we're connected. So you see my head right now. So Mike Kevin, you feel ready? Kevin Kevin ready. ready for you, right? Yeah, it's fine. I will cut that noise. Okay, one minute. Yep. Yeah, Denise, you tell me when it's five, right? Hello everybody, welcome in this webinar on uh, API performance in real-time APIs. We will start really soon. Maybe we'll just wait for one more minute for everybody to be able to join. Uh, so if you have any questions, you have a chat section in Zoom to be able to uh, send your question to our panelists, right? So we will go back in maybe one minute for wait, to wait everybody to join. Thank you very much. joining we're just saying that we will begin in like now 30 seconds uh, you can ask some questions about for our panelists uh, on in the chat section of zoom so don't hesitate we will have a 10 minutes at the end for answering all questions so yeah 20 seconds from now we will we will start waiting for all participants to join thank you Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, API um, performance and real-time uh, uh, API webinar, right? We will host uh, uh, two great speakers today, Kevin Jones and Mike Amundsen, uh, for a discussion about 45 minutes, 50 minutes with your question that will be uh, one hour, about uh, how to manage performance and how to transition to real-time APIs uh, using recent and state-of-the-art technologies and, and mindsets, right? Uh, so, a few things before, uh, before we start about this webinar to give you a little bit more context. Uh, so, this webinar is brought to you by uh, three entities, uh, uh, right? Um, so, the first entity uh, that brings you this webinar is API Conference Series. So, may, some of you may have attended to this series of conferences on APIs. Uh, and they are held in nine countries every year since 2012 and uh, they feature the main speakers of the space, and Mike and Kevin have been, have been speakers of these API, API days conferences. We are glad to have them today for our webinar. 
This webinar is also uh, brought to you by uh, epicin.io. It's the API community-driven media platform, so epicin.io, where speakers of API days and followers of the space contribute with uh, articles and, and, and videos about uh, the API industry. So if you want to know more, if you want to know more about API news or uh, industry-related news about APIs, API uh, uh, mindset or API vendors, yeah, this is the, the place to go. And also, uh, this webinar is also in partnership with uh, Nginx, uh, a leader in the API management uh, solutions with that uh, Kevin will tell you a little bit more uh, afterwards. So the question we will try to answer today is that uh, what is API performance monitoring? Why it's important for my organization and my IT capabilities? Uh, we'll try to also to answer the question about how to manage your API traffic for speed while maintaining safety. We're in a world that is more and more connected. One slow service and one slow API on top of it can make the whole system slow. So how do I avoid this contamination of bad performance, right? And how do I maintain my SLA? In the second part, we will try to answer the question, what are real-time APIs, right? How they differ from classic polling APIs, right? What are the advantages and also the drawbacks, right? And, and also we'll try to, we will see a demo about how to build and manage real-time APIs, right? Uh, we will see a little bit, uh, we'll discover what can be shared in, in, in like 10, 15 minutes by, by Kevin. And, and again, if you have any more questions, Kevin will be available for questions or later in the talk. So we have two great speakers, uh, uh, internationally known, both of them. So Mike Amundsen, which is, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, which is a known author and, and lecturer. He is author of many books, and especially two ones that we want to feature here, API Traffic Management 101. And he would be, we are glad to have an excerpt of his book uh, for that webinar. And the book is preparing about designing, about designing and building great web APIs, right? A real a book about uh, tooling and then really how to do step by step. In the second part, we have Kevin Jones, which is also an inter international lecturer on API management, and who is also senior product manager at F5, uh, and, and, and a big specialist of the Nginx open source uh, platform. And he will be able to, uh, to demonstrate his, um, his expertise on the topic and also to make you a demo about, about what's going on. So we will start with uh, Micah Monson. Again, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat, uh, right, to, for us to, to be able to answer them at the end. And Mike, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, take over the screen and present you Present us what you prepared for us on API traffic management. Okay. Well, let's see if we can't get started here. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Uh, very pleased to join you and uh, all the attendees. Um, so the talk I prepared for today is to focus on this notion of high-performing APIs and how to architect for speed at scale. So I thought we would just talk about a few things. Uh, as Mehdi already mentioned, this is, uh, uh, this is how you find me. You can find me on LinkedIn and GitHub and YouTube and Twitter. I would love to connect with you, learn what you're working on and what kinds of uh, things are challenging for you. Uh, Mehdi mentioned that uh, I had authored a small book, API Traffic Management 101, and thanks to Nginx, you can download a free copy of this book. I'll be pulling material from this book for this talk. So if you want to dig in a little bit deeper, at the end of my slide deck, I'll have a download link for you to, uh, to take a copy of this. So I thought I would talk about uh, just a few key things. What is the performance imperative? What is it that's changing the way we're working on APIs today? And uh, then talk about how we can meet that, uh, that challenge, how we can uh, change our architecture, uh, focus on how we monitor when we want to focus on performance, and then how we can use architecture and management to uh, monitoring to actually improve the management of our API program. So it's more than just a single API, it's hundreds of APIs. It's millions of transactions for thousands of services. How do we deal with that? Um, but before jumping into that, let's just talk a little bit about this thing called performance imperative. Really there are three elements I wanted to talk about in this sort of vital change that we're seeing happening in lots of API organizations. It's the tr transformation of their ecosystem itself with the introduction of real-time APIs of various types. It's a change in the call volume for APIs where uh, uh, polling or typical REST style HTTP call and response APIs 
uh, at one kind of volume level, that volume level changes dramatically when we start to talking about real-time APIs. And then we need to talk about response time, which is related to call volume. So we've got some real challenges ahead of us. One of the big things that's moving this, uh, this uh, whole idea of real-time APIs, um, I'm gonna quote from a study from IDC recently. 90% uh, of organizations say that they're gonna be using microservices in some kind of way, either microservices they build themselves or microservices from somewhere else. That's gonna put a huge uh, uh, a weight on the idea of transactions and management and API performance. As we have more and more services, we have more and more traffic. And that traffic is really the next uh, uh, thing that IDC talked a lot about. We're gonna have uh, three quarters of our organizations are going to be uh, seeing massive changes in API calls in the next uh, two years. Uh, as many as 250 million calls a month. We're gonna have to figure out how we can do almost a million calls every uh, a, a single day, uh, uh, 10 million calls every day. And three quarters of the organizations also think that they're, they're going to have to deal with demands of under 20 milliseconds. That's 3,000 uh, transactions a second. So that's a huge increase in demand on a lot of organizations, especially those of us who have been around a long time, built up a lot of legacy uh, material and intellectual property. This could be a big change for us, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with this in some kind of way. So 90% of the companies need to support services, 80% of respondents expect 250 mil a million calls a month, and about 60% of these respondents in the IDC study say they're gonna to need to be doing calls within 20 milliseconds or 3,000 calls a second. So that's a huge performance imperative that we're going to have to meet in some way. And that imperative is gonna be placed on us not just by uh, internal organizations, but by third parties, by our customers, by the people that we count on. And so we're gonna to have to figure out how to deal with this. So, so how do we meet these new demands? What is it we need to be dealing with? Whether you're a small organization or a large organization, what are the challenges that you've got before you? So I want to talk about a couple of different ones, and I want to start by talking about this idea of architecting for performance. What is it we need to do to change our architecture? So we'll, we'll talk about a handful of things. And, and the first one I want to bring up is that lift and shift is not going to be enough. Uh, simply copying your on-premise architecture, your on-premise services to servers in the cloud is, really has its limits. Now, if it turns out you have a highly scalable, highly transaction-oriented, uh, um, resilient system running on-prem, maybe you'll be able to move it in the cloud. But most of us don't. Most of us have re relatively large systems. We count on being local. Adding distance is going to really change our math. It's really going to make it challenging for us to meet that 20 millisecond response time. Adding connections is going to change the way our gateway and our service platform works. It means we're going to have lots more to deal with at any second. So distance and connections slows performance right away. So simply copying from on-prem to off-prem or from prem to the cloud is not going to make it. And on top of that, native storage and services, the, the services and storage mediums that are built for the cloud operate under very different rules than those for on-prem. We don't have transactions. We don't have uh, uh, a, a persistent connection. We've got lots of things we're gonna have to figure out and how to deal with in the future. So that means we need to start thinking about redesigning our services. One of the reasons services became smaller over those last decade is this very reason of increasing performance and reliability. So we don't want to make services smaller just because smaller is fun. Smaller is more effective at scale. And there are, that means we're going to introduce wait states. We have to figure out how to reduce that waiting for the next response or waiting for the next transaction. That means introducing asynchronous technology. You can do that a couple of different ways through queuing services, through polling services, through actual uh, event-based uh, uh, subscriptions. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. And another huge uh, change in our design, designing of services is building in reversal and recovery, the ability to reverse a transaction, to reverse a particular set of transactions, and to recover from failures, recover from a failed step and a series of steps. We go through five-step process to maybe complete an order. We need, we need to uh, book the order. We need to pick the materials. We need to schedule shipping. We need to handle payment. And then we need to handle a response back to the customer. If one of those steps goes, goes haywire, we're going to have to unroll the other one. So reversal and recovery are key. 
Now, just not just the services need to change, but actually the way we engineer our data, where we store it, how we store it, how we access it is also going to have to change. That means we're going to have to rely heavily on caching results. That means uh, when I make a, a request for some data, I should keep a copy of that in case I have that request again. Now, sometimes caching doesn't always work. We have very unique information that changes quite a bit. That means we need to think about stage copies. We need to have a copy of the data set, so a copy of the parts list or a copy of our product list staged around different places in the country, in the world, in your ecosystem, so that I have reduced that distance. Remember, distance connection is a key. Finally, stage copies may not be enough as well. I may need, have to be doing streaming writes. So I may have to actually write a lot of transactions. If I've got a, a lot of messaging, a lot of communication, then I have to write those locally and maybe queue those up somewhere else later. I'm gonna have to resolve streaming writes uh, through some kind of uh, process. So caching, staging, and streaming are gonna be ways to re-engineer and rethink the way we do data. And then finally, another big one is the network itself. Remember, now the network is actually all over the planet. Uh, the network isn't just our machines in our head end, or our machines and the ones down the street or ones in the next town. They could be machines that we don't own that are somewhere else that are run by some other organization like Azure or AWS or, or Google or someone else. So we're going to have to rethink how we use the network itself. We're going to have to decrease our message size. Just like we decrease service size, we're going to decrease the message size as well. That means we're going to have to increase message volume. We'll have lots and lots of transactions of small interactions. The advantage of decreasing the message size is that I can get more uh, volume through the system. The advantage of having more volume in the system means that even if one small thing goes wrong, I can actually repeat it over and over again. And all of this is, this is leading to the return of remote procedure calling or RPC as a pattern that we're going to need to depend on when we think about the network. Establishing a network and managing a network to do lots of small uh, calls is very different than a network for doing uh, just a, 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 a larger number of big transactions. So we're going to have to think about returning to RPC and what that means. So that's the architecture part. That talks about how we're gonna change services, we're gonna change our data modeling, and we're gonna change our network modeling. Now, when we start making those changes, we also need to be prepared for how we're going to start monitoring what we're doing. How are we doing on all these areas? And like so many other things, monitoring is a multi-level or a multi-aspect element. Infrastructure, services, and business, they all combine to provide monitoring data from very different sources, for very different reasons. We're particularly interested in infrastructure in the beginning. We wanna make sure we have the right memory and CPU and machines are up and running and networks are available and gateways and so on and so forth. But that's just the very tip. That's sort of like we say, the ticket to, you know, to enter. We also need to be monitoring our services. What are our service latencies? What are our service performances? What are our error conditions on services? Are they preventing customers from getting the jobs done that they really want? Can they not check out? Can they not find products? Is it taking too long for them to actually compute the net present value of a particular property they want to buy? So on and so forth. And then finally, those infrastructure and those services are really there for a business reason. We need to be adding customers, selling products, providing services, uh, streaming information. What are our business level goals? Have we met our business level goals? We need to monitor each one of those in turn and in kind on a constant basis. So as I mentioned for infrastructure, I need to be monitoring machines and networks and connections. CPU, bandwidth, memory, saturation, all these other things that we need to focus on. And you can find lots of great tooling and lots of great instruction on that step. At the service level, I need to monitor individual microservices. Are they doing the transaction work they need? ESBs, gateways. So I'll be talking about latency, error rates, rate limiting, all these other things that make sense. Security also becomes an issue at the service level as well. I need to make sure that only people who are authorized are actually using this particular service. And finally, at the business level, as I said before, I'm interested in users, transactions, sales, closings, streaming data, all these completed orders, all these other things that are really, really important. So I need to have dashboards for each one of these. 
uh, I need a dashboard for my infrastructure, I need a dashboard for my services, and I need a dashboard for my key business transactions. And this even rolls back to the notion of we plan our business, we say what services we need for that business, and we build the infrastructure for those services as well. So it goes both ways. Developing a monitoring culture in all aspects is really, really critical. Because once you have a monitoring culture, once you have a dashboard culture so you can see instantly what's going on at a particular time, you can actually start to manage for performance. Now, our performance is not just on a particular transaction. It's not on just a set of services. Now it's actually at business level itself. So we can start to focusing on getting inside into our organization, solving problems as they come up, solving them quickly and easily. And even past that, anticipating needs inside the organization before customers even see the problem. So I often share this graphic. This is one of the ones that's in the book. This is really what traffic management and monitoring for speed really talks about. In the beginning, we're just going to focus on getting those request monitors correct. Eventually, we need to move on to scaling services, diagnosing errors, and controlling access and making sure that we're doing the work we need to stay healthy. And finally, we need to figure out how to automatically recover from failure and experiment within the system to make it even more powerful. So how can we do that? <clears throat> Insights, of course, means monitoring traffic, the same stuff we talked about earlier, but it also means monitoring builds. You're, you're managing the performance of the entire organization. How long does it take? Uh, uh, Mary Poppendi has this great line, how long does it take to get from feature to function, from idea to install inside your organization? How many days, how many weeks, how many months? You need to monitor how long it takes for you to build the solutions inside the organization and manage accordingly. That means dashboards for bills. Then we have the same thing for solving problems. Monitor your security, watch for security, pen testing, all these other things. Look ahead for problems. Scaling services, all, you're almost in a, transact, uh, a, a traffic management mode, just like automobiles. There's a pile up on the, on the 401. I need to get more service in this particular area of the country or this particular area of the world because we're getting a lot more business there. And then diagnosing errors. Diagnosing errors can be a huge challenge inside a microservice uh, space where you've got millions of transactions, but you've got to figure out how to do it. And there's some great techniques for using transaction IDs and collecting information and running experiments on the information that you have in order to diagnose the real problem. And that leads to this last step, this idea of automating recovery and running experiments. So it's fine if you know the server's about to go down, it's even better if you can automatically have the system replace that server with a healthy server. I notice this server's memory and CPU are bad, I'm gonna take it out of uh, rotation, put a new one in instead. That's automating recovery. I noticed these transactions didn't complete. I'm going to put them in a queue and try to solve as many as I can. The ones that I can't, I'm going to queue up to a human to deal with later tonight. And that means finally running experiments. So that's site reliability engineering, chaos engineering, using those kinds of techniques and services to manage your overall performance to make sure you're meeting your company's goals. So this is a lot to take in, but it's really pretty straightforward. We want to make sure that we prepare for call volumes to go up and transaction time to go down. That is the imper imperative. That's the challenge in front of us. We want to make sure we start thinking about redesigning services, re-engineering the way we store and, and manage data, and rethink the way we're using networks. Those are the architectural level elements that we need to focus on and that we can manage for. Once we start building this, we need to monitor our infrastructure, our services, and our business metrics for goals. And we need to adjust accordingly every step along the way. We're not talking about quarterly review here. We're actually talking about high performance APIs, real time APIs. So that means real time performance review all the time. And then that leads us to managing for our overall performance, managing the traffic, resolving any problems that come up and anticipating the needs for the future. This is a whole new world. This is a whole new set of opportunities, very exciting opportunities that all of us have in, in front of us. And I love this quote from Warren Bennis, who's famous for writing over almost 30 books on leadership. His biggest one is on becoming a leader. You know, and he says, in life, change is inevitable, but in business, change is vital. And it's vital that we think about how to deal with these high performance uh, situations, that we focus on real-time APIs. It's going to give us lots and lots of opportunity as well as challenge ahead. 
Now, as I mentioned, um, all of this and more is in a, a small book I wrote called API Traffic Management 101. I, and thanks to our sponsor, Nginx, you can download a free copy at this URL. Um, that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. And I just want to say thank you to uh, API Days and API Scene, as well as Nginx for the chance to talk to you today. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I think it's a great overview about all the different dimensions uh, <laughs> to handle API traffic management in, in API uh, monitoring. Uh, just check. I think uh, I thought we had a question. No, we don't have a question. Maybe just waiting for uh, for Kevin to share his slide. Just maybe a quick question about you know what we often what we call KPIs for APIs. Like what are what are just by by remember remembering all the you know the metrics that you've seen being used like you know average time response or first time to uh time to first byte you know time to last byte you know uh what are all the panel of metrics that can be used for performance yeah there, so there's actually a handful of them there are a handful of sort of at the that infrastructure level there's a thing called um red which is uh, uh requests errors and duration there's a formula it's also one called use, which is, um, I forget what the U is for, a scalability and error rate. So there are a few of these sort of, uh, uh, sort of formulas for the infrastructure level. And then as you mentioned, there's this idea of KPIs for APIs, right? So there's this fantastic experience uh, from uh, the Intel days, which is coming up with these uh, key performance indicators. Key performance indicators are usually the business level elements, so we wanna be focusing on things like uh, latency and, and uh, error rates and, and rate limits and things like that. So you can use KPIs as a way to start to that. But to back up even further, KPIs really exist because of a thing called OKRs, objectives and key results, right? So those are the business level elements. So one of the things that's really important is to focus on what are my business goals? I need more users, I need more sale, I need more streaming. So you use those business goals to create the key performance indicators. What indicates that I'm closing more orders? Well, I need to make sure that this particular service works really well. And then the, what do those key performance indicators need in terms of things like latency and error rates and duration and things like that? And that leads back to that infrastructure part. So really OKRs, KPIs, and then right down to the individual elements are really key. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, we have a question from Lucas, but it, as it com has some uh, real-time infrastructure element, uh, I think it's better to keep it for after Kevin's presentation. So Kevin, can you, can you take it over? Yep, no problem. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Great. So thank you, Mike. That was, uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, a lot of insights there, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, real quick, um, you know, the topic of my talk today is about real-time APIs, and we're going to be talking specifically about API gateways and API management, and a little bit about what you can monitor and what you can look for uh, in your application stack, and just talk a little bit about how Nginx can help, and I'm going to do a little bit of a demo. So thank you guys for joining. Uh, real quick. Uh, introduction, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm a senior product manager at, at Nginx. Um, yep. I've actually been- Kevin? At... Yep. Yeah, Back can you here. share your screen? I think, yeah, I think we don't see your screen. Oh, really? I hope it didn't crash. We saw it like for one second then. Let's hope it didn't crash. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, Let's try. yeah, I think, I think it works now. Can you see okay? Okay. Yes, I think I think we see it now. Just make it full screen and it will be good. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Sorry okay. for that. Okay. No worries. Thank you. So again, uh, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm a senior product manager at Nginx, uh, which is now part of F5 Networks. And I've been at Nginx for a little bit over four years, uh, coming up on five years now. And um, you know, one of the things that brought me to Nginx was the amount of capabilities that it had around API uh, orchestration and API management. Um, it's commonly used as reverse proxy and it's been a huge part of even before working at Nginx, me as a Nginx user, uh, to sit in front of our applications. 
so I would like to uh, briefly talk a little bit about the current state of APIs. Um, Mike addressed some of this earlier, but I think it makes sense to talk a little bit about the adoption. Um, according to the programmable web, um, over the last you know, uh, 15 years or so, uh, the increase in publicly exposed APIs has drastically increased. And there's been a huge sp spike in these publicly exposed APIs uh, over the recent years. Um, with the mass production of mobile devices, IoT devices, and the adoption of newer application designs such as uh, service-oriented architectures or microservices uh, has really increased the need for these publicly exposed APIs uh, over the recent years. Um, and according to Akamai, in fact, uh, the State of the Internet Security Report says that a staggering 83% of all web traffic is actually represented by API traffic or API calls. Um, and so obviously uh, the need for these uh, additional devices to be available and publicly exposed on the internet is driving this, right? Uh, as of 2015, a total of about 15.41 billion devices were connected to the internet. And according to new technologies around uh, 5G and other IoT related advancements, uh, that's actually gonna balloon up to about 75 billion devices by the year 2025. Uh, so the need for API, um, uh, exposed publicly exposed APIs on the internet today is just going to increase um, even more. Um, that's an increase of about 500%. Uh, and so we really need to start thinking now about how we can serve these APIs reliably and effectively to our clients. Uh, so what is a real-time API and exactly why are they important? Um, so if, if you think of it from a performance perspective, you know, the typical API client that most companies uh, are most worried about from a performance perspective are external, right? These are internet facing clients that in turn need to consume an API for some kind of business case. Uh, they need to be able to access the API reliably and quickly, and the need for these APIs to be accessible uh, for various reasons. It could be for consumption revenue where they're actually trying to monetize an API and drive their business. Uh, these could be partner integration points, right, where you're working with third-party vendors that also might be driving revenue growth or maybe part of some kind of requirement that your application is exposed. Uh, or it could be for things like mobile applications or IoT devices and a core part of your uh, infrastructure that you're uh, trying to serve to clients. Um, and so the need for these real-time APIs comes up in really many use cases in many industries. Uh, some just to kind of mention, one would be something like a chat tool. So uh, I don't know if you guys have used your phones lately to create some kind of ticket or some kind of support uh, for a different application or maybe like one of some kind of uh, company that you're trying to communicate with. Uh, it's a growing need now for most applications to have some kind of real-time chat integration. Uh, if you go to Amazon or if you go to like Alibaba or something like that and you try to file a support ticket, you're not gonna call someone on the phone, you're gonna use the app to chat with them. Um, it's just a more effective thing. And so the ability to have a real-time API in a situation like that is very critical, right? Those, those consumers need to be able to access and uh, communicate with you over uh, your API pretty quickly. There's also a need for uh, uh, finances, right? Uh, being able to do things like fraud detection or being able to validate transactions in a reliable, quick way, right? Um, this is driving the digital economy um, where most transactions now, especially uh, with things like COVID-19, where everyone is ordering things from home and having things uh, delivered, uh, the ability to quickly uh, validate transactions and quickly detect fraud is very important for real-time APIs as well. Uh, and then lastly is all the IoT devices, right? There's been a huge spike in IoT devices, um, Amazon Alexa, Google Home, uh, all of the uh, webcams and all of the various uh, pet tooling that they have for IoT devices has created a huge spike in API traffic. Uh, and the ability for those devices to quickly respond, uh, if you're talking to Amazon and you say, hey Alexa, I need the weather, what is the weather? You don't wanna wait a minute for your response, you want it right away, right? And so these devices need to have real-time API access, right? Um, and so the truth is that most companies um, have way more than a single or a few external APIs. They typically have a lot. Um, so in most cases, they put those APIs in an internal network, something somewhere where it's somewhat protected, uh, and they sit something like a load balancer or an API gateway 
uh, to basically act as a traditional reverse proxy to protect those applications, right? Common sense. Um, and I think this is an architecture that most of you guys uh, are very familiar with. Um, but that layer actually has a lot of things to do. Um, it's a very important key piece to your infrastructure because it is literally the gateway, uh, the API gateway or the, the reverse proxy into your network. So it's got to do things like routing traffic based on HTTP level request information. It's got to be able to do maybe request response re manipulation, right? Uh, being able to decide how it wants to communicate with other devices, uh, whether it be JSON or YAML or whatever other uh, programmatic coding that you want to use for your API. It's also got to be able to shape your traffic and be able to move traffic in a, a secure way. Maybe you need to be able to do A-B testing. Maybe you need to be able to do blue-green deployments. Um, and you also need to be able to do authentication and authorization of those access of those APIs. In most cases, if it's a revenue uh, streaming API, there's a good chance that all of your API clients are either passing a key or passing an API, API JWT token or something like that. And so you need something there that can sit and protect those APIs and decide what kind of access that the clients have. Uh, then it needs to be able to do additional security like DDoS protection, rate limiting, uh, you know, additional access control, right, for those APIs. Maybe it needs to do GOIP information. It needs to figure out where those clients are coming from a GOIP perspective and make decisions on where and what, what kind of countries can access those APIs. There's lots of things that can go into additional security. Web application firewall, right? Uh, and then also load balancing uh, is a core uh, part of it, uh, API gateways or reverse proxy typically, uh, and then also caching. So there's a lot that that layer has to do. And so you have to be careful when you are sitting something like that, it needs some, need to be something reliable and it needs to be something that can uh, really serve uh, at a very high uh, response rate for your clients. So uh, the end goal really is your clients are coming through your network, they're hitting some kind of reverse proxy or API gateway or load balancer or whatever you want to call it, and they're hitting your APIs uh, in a secure fashion, right? Um, the real end all goal is to keep your latency down, right? Uh, most companies, uh, as some of the metrics that you heard from Mike, uh, want to keep their uh, request response below about 50 milliseconds. We actually think at Nginx that a reliable uh, milliseconds is somewhere in the range of 30 milliseconds. A lot of companies actually want to try to keep it even lower, uh, all the way down to like 13 milliseconds. And at the same time, you need to keep the performance up of your application servers uh, to whatever your SLA it is that you think is comfortable for those applications. So it, it's really up on the back end and it's down on the client end. So if you balance this correctly, you can really have a reliable application infrastructure. So uh, how exactly do you monitor and measure this stuff? Um, it's fairly simple to do. Um, I think the most difficult part is trying to figure out exactly what you're trying to monitor um, and how you're going to monitor it. Um, we have a tool that we created and this is available on GitHub. Uh, if you go to github.com slash Nginx Inc slash uh, RT API, it's called Real Time API. Um, it's open source and it's, it is just a command line tool. It's not really designed to be used uh, in a real time uh, monitoring solution. It's really to get an idea of what kind of uh, response rate that you're currently getting from your API. And I'm gonna demo it here in a little bit. Um, it's all built on Golang and it's going to provide you with an overall idea of how much latency is going through when you, when you process your requests, how many requests, how many responses that are coming back, what those responses kind of look like from an overall per, uh, percentile. And then it's also gonna generate a PDF for you that you can look at and see exactly uh, what kind of uh, 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 latency curve that you're getting. And the cool thing about it is it actually uses what's called corrected omissions, um, where it's going to take into the account of any requests that are currently waiting to be processed before they actually hit the API gateway or hit the API. And so what that's gonna do is it's going to give you a more accurate uh, curve, as we would call it, a latency curve, so that you can really determine what kind of traffic is flowing through um, in a certain percentile that you're trying to get, right? So every company has a certain percentile that they're trying to uh, achieve um, some companies like Google and Facebook have a, what would they call the five nines, right? Uh, some companies that may be a little bit more smaller and have less infrastructure might not need to hit that full five nine, maybe they only need one nine. 
So it might be 99.9% or two nines. Um, so we're gonna give you this access to this, uh, this dashboard that you can kind of look at. It's not a dashboard, it's, it's a PDF. Uh, let's be honest. Um, and it's going to give you that on screen feedback. You can also use if you're using Golang just by running go get and putting the uh, URL for the GitHub in there, it will actually fetch out and install it for you. So if you already have your Golang environment set up on your machine, it's just as simple as typing that in and it'll download and create a executable for you to run. Okay. Uh, the next thing is if you're using um, open source, uh, Nginx open source or um, you know, as an API gateway or as a reverse proxy or load balance or any of the scenarios where I mentioned before, um, you have a logging, right? So the logs there are fully customizable and you can log a lot of information on those, on those uh, variables. Uh, any variable that's available in Nginx can be logged. Uh, if you're using Nginx Plus, we have a JSON-based metric API that has a little bit over 100 metrics that are available. Uh, things like HTTP connections, requests, uh, the types of requests, the types of response, uh, current amount of connections. And this is available in a JSON API that can be accessible either locally, just by grabbing it and pulling it into something like Splunk or Datadog or AppDynamics, whatever tool that you currently use for an APM. Uh, or you can use Nginx Controller, which is our API management plane that allows you to visualize over time all of the data that comes back from the logs and comes back from the API. So the Nginx controller is a great solution if you're looking, if you have a large amount of Nginx instances and you wanna see exactly how those instances are performing over a long duration of time, you can actually come in here and you can see here that we have a one hour, four hour, one day, two days, week. So you can actually extend that out and really get an idea of how, how's your API been performing over a very long, long period of time. And so there's a lot of power in those devices. Uh, these are obviously commercial uh, offerings that we have available. If you guys want to learn more about this, you can go to nginx.com and you can get some um, more information there. You can even download a trial of both Nginx Plus and Nginx Controller if you need to as well. So um, how can Nginx help? Other than the stuff I just mentioned right now from a monitoring perspective, um, I want to show you guys in real time exactly the differences between using just straight API, publicly exposed, unprotected, uncontrolled, and then I want to re-scan uh, with Nginx and show you the, the variation and the control that you get with something as powerful as Nginx in front of your APIs. So to do this, um, my demo environment is all running in AWS. I have two EC2 instances running in uh, US West, which I'm in San Francisco right now, and I'm on, on the API server, I'm running Docker, and I have what's called a Formula One API. If you guys aren't familiar with it, it's kind of a demo API that is available in Docker Compose uh, or Docker, and it runs on Apache, PHP, and MySQL, so it's the LAMP stack, essentially. And it all runs in Docker Compose, and so you can run Docker Compose up, and it will spin it up for you. Um, and it runs on port 8000, which is mapped inside the Docker container at port 80. So publicly exposed, uh, I'm gonna have port 8000. And then it's running a database internal only on port 3306. Uh, and so this is the application that I'm gonna be using. Um, it's the JSON API and it gives kind of like fake information uh, about Formula One that you can use. Uh, and I'm gonna show you here in a second. And then I'm gonna put Nginx in front of that and I'm gonna scan just directly to the API and then I'm also gonna scan directly to Nginx and then we're gonna kind of compare those two, right? And to do that, we're gonna use the RT API CLI that I talked to you guys about and we're gonna be calling slash API slash F1. So uh, the API is publicly exposed on slash API slash F1 and then it is a discoverable API and there's additional uh, paths that you can hit but I'm just gonna be hit the root path which is a pretty large JSON object. Uh, so we should be able to get a good amount of traffic just by querying that. And again, as I mentioned before, it, this real-time API uh, spins up reports. So I'm gonna be publish those, publishing those into a directory that's also running on Nginx just so that we can look at those. So again, both these instances are running in uh, AWS. They are separate instances. So there is some level of API communication that we can kind of simulate from one API to another. So that being said, uh, let's go ahead and do that demo. 
Um, so first of all, I want to show you the, the backend server. Uh, so this is the server that is actually running the API. So if we come here, we do a Docker PS-A, we can see that Docker is running and we can see that we have two containers, as I was telling you guys before. We have one that's called Ergast F1 API Web, which is the web server and the PHP. And it's been up for seven days. Um, so I spun it up last week. And then we have another container that's called Ergast F1 API Ergast DB, which is running MySQL. And it also has been up for seven days. So everything's healthy. Um, we can actually run a curl just against it. Uh, local host port 8000 slash API slash F1. And we can see that it's responding, right? Uh, if we do a curl dash I, we can see exactly what the headers look like. So we can see here that it's running Apache 2.47 and it's running PHP. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm just gonna show you guys that Nginx is not running. So first I'm gonna do a PSAUX grep Nginx and no Nginx is running. So we're just running Docker right now on port 8000 and we're just publicly exposing that. So on my other server, which is on this next tab here on the left, so I'm gonna click that. I have my test, test taker machine. Uh, so I'm already logged into this machine. And if you download the real-time API tool, um, the way that it works is you can either pass YAML configurations into it, or you can also pass JSON configurations into it uh, to be able to decide what you want to test. So I have two test files. One is for F1 directly, and one is through Nginx. So let's take a look at uh, the, F, the F1 first, okay? So all we're saying is that here is the HTTP URL for the actual API. And we can see here that it's listening on port 8000, like I was mentioning, and we're gonna be querying that. And we're gonna be doing get requests. We're not doing anything fancy. We're not doing posts or any kind of manipulation to the API. We're just getting information back. We're gonna spin up eight threads from the tool to be able to test in real time. So eight different um, concurrent threads with a maximum that it can scale to 16 to try to achieve the request rate of 1000 requests per second. And we're gonna also use 16 connections to do that. And we're gonna scan for 20 seconds, okay? So again, eight threads with a maximum to 16, 16 connections with a request rate of 1000 requests per second. So let's save that and let's run that. So we're gonna do the real-time API tool. We're gonna to specify the file that I just mentioned right here, which is the endpoint f1.eml file and we're gonna output the results to my web server directory, which is the user share Nginx HTML reports folder. And we're just gonna call it what the data is today so that we can uh, have a unique result on that PDF file. And then we're also gonna print the results to screen. So this is all one line that you can type to run this. So let's go ahead and run that. Um, and what's, what's happening right now is Go is spinning up, again, anywhere from eight to 16 threads and it's trying to achieve a request rate of a thousand requests per second um, over the period of 20 seconds to that API, okay? Uh, so it should be almost done here in a second. Let's give it a second. All right, so it is complete. So we can see here on the screen the results that we get. So we're actually getting a request total of, so we were, we were able to send 5,877 requests and only were able to reach a rate of 293 requests per second. So that's a very low. It's actually very way below what we were trying to achieve. We were trying to achieve a thousand requests per second, uh, but we didn't, we weren't able to hit that. We did do a full 20 second duration and we can see the latency here. So we are getting six milliseconds minimum mean, which is the average 54 milliseconds. So it's not horrible. Uh, but if we look here at the 99th percentile, we're actually doing about 523 milliseconds. And if we look at the uh, maximum, one of the calls took three seconds. So that's not too great, right? Um, and again, this is going directly to the PHP and the Apache server. So now what we wanna do is bring up that, um, let's bring up that uh, survey. Sorry. So let's come over here and start Nginx. So let's go to slash USR, SBIN, Nginx, and let's start Nginx now. And then let's come back over here and let's get that report. So we can see there's a new report in the directory. It's right here, that's the one that I just ran. And we can take a look at that and see what it looks like. So this is what it's gonna give me. 
it's going to give me a report that shows me my latency. So it's very similar to what I just said. So at the 99 percentile, I'm at 102 milliseconds, right? Um, but we don't really care too much about the 99%. We actually care more about the way over here in the 99.9. Uh, if we look, all of a sudden it spikes up to over 300 milliseconds. So it's not too great of a result. So it's not exactly what we were looking for. And I know you guys, it's hard for you guys to see that on the screen, but uh, if you guys uh, try out the tool, you'll be able to zoom in and out and see that. So now what we're gonna do is go back, since we've started in Nginx, let's make sure that Nginx is running. Now we have Nginx running. We have two worker processes that are sitting in front, one master and two, uh, two child worker processes. And we're also running Nginx. So let's take a look at the Nginx real quick, uh, the Nginx config. And I'm gonna show you guys what I configured on it. It's pretty basic. It's a very basic Nginx config. All I'm doing is using one upstream, which is the local host server on port 8000. So all I'm doing is proxying. So Nginx is gonna be listening on port 80 right here. And then it's proxying to 8000, which is the API, right? And we're using keep alive connections to that, to that API server. And we're setting up a cache, proxy cache. And we're not sending up request limits or anything like that. Um, we're not doing anything really advanced on this. All we're doing is uh, adding a header and enabling basic load balancing. So I'm just proxying to that single server. It's actually not even load balancing. It's only one server on the backend. So really it's just a reverse proxy. And I'm caching results uh, that have a 200 okay that are get and head requests for one second. So basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm enabling micro caching. So I have a, a static directory called API cache, uh, or a, sorry, a static memory zone called API cache. And I'm saying that all get requests or head requests that are 200 OKs to cache for one second. So it's called micro caching. And we're gonna turn on revalidation. We're gonna turn on background update. These are just some micro caching features that you can enable. You can read more about these on the Nginx uh, documentation. Um, and we're gonna say that if Nginx is in the process of updating the cache, we're gonna use the stale uh, and we're gonna serve what's in, available in its cache. Uh, we're also going to turn off the server tokens. This is just a security feature. But other than that, um, we're not really doing too much. And then down here below, we can see that anything that matches a root path, which is the root context, we're going to serve a 404. But anything that exactly matches slash API slash F1, we're going to reverse proxy to that uh, HTTP Formula 1 API. So if you're familiar with Nginx, it's a very standard config configuration. You can, you can take my word for that. So now let's do a curl against that server on port 80 this time. So first let's do the, the root context, which is slash. We're getting a 404. So that's good. We're protecting the root context of the application. And we're also uh, re returning a custom error page if you didn't notice here, um, which is saying resource not found. Um, you can read more about this again on our Nginx website about how to protect your APIs with Nginx. If we do a curl dash I, we can see that Nginx is just responding with just Nginx. So we don't know what version's there. So we're also protecting that uh, from the client. So now let's do a slash API slash F1 call and see if that works. And it does. So we were able to get through to the API. Let's just get rid of the headers and it's working. So reverse proxy is working. So now what we're gonna do is come back to our test machine and we're gonna run one more test. Okay, and this time we're going to test directly through nginx and we're going to scale up the traffic we're actually going to add 16 threads we're going to double the amount of threads and then we're going to quadruple the maximum so it actually can go all the way to 64 if it needs to we're really making it four times more threads and we're actually making four four times more connections and we're making four four times more requests as well so we're actually doing four thousand requests per second of a duration of 20 seconds so we're going to push the envelope we're going to take that even one step higher and do four times the amount of traffic to that server. So now let's run this one more time. And this time let's use Nginx YAML. So we're gonna do RTA API to the Nginx YAML and put the same report out and let that run. So again, this time we're spinning up anywhere from 16 to 64 threads and we are spinning up 64 connections per thread. So that's 64 times 64 and then we're also trying to push a maximum request rate of 4,000 requests per second over the duration of that. 
okay, cool. So we were done. Uh, the results are back. We were actually able to send 80,000 requests and we were able to achieve our 4,000 requests per second that I was trying to reach. And we can see here that the maximum wait time was actually, if you look at this little character right here, this is considered microseconds. So the maximum anyone, any time that the test machine had to run was only half of a millisecond. So it was actually 594 microseconds. So we're basically beating our expectations by a lot. And then we look at the latencies, we can see that the minimum latency was 349 microseconds. The average was half of a, a millisecond or 669 microseconds. And even if we look all the way at the 99 percentile, uh, it was 4.18 milliseconds. And the, the longest anyone had to wait, the maximum was 15 milliseconds. So I think that was a huge success just by sitting in Nginx in front of those APIs. So let, one more time, let's go back to the directory. Let's get the new PDF, which is right here that I just generated. And let's take a look at that. And let's see how, what the difference looks like. So a huge difference. So we can see here that the latency for the 99th percentile was only four milliseconds. So compared to previously, it was 102 milliseconds. The new one with Nginx, and this is four times the amount of traffic, we're getting four milliseconds, and we're way below the 30 milliseconds that we're trying to achieve right here. If you see this is 30 milliseconds here, 300, mil, uh, 300 milliseconds. So the curve is exactly what we're trying to achieve. So even at the 99.99999, the 59 percentile, we're sitting at about 15 milliseconds. So that's the demo. Um, so I do wanna go back to the slides here and uh, I do wanna take a second to see if you guys have any questions um, about any of this. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, for uh, the demo. Microseconds, right? So that's, uh, that's, really, uh, that's really low, right? Uh, well, microservice, microseconds, soon nanoseconds, <laughs> right? I hope, I hope. So we have a question from uh, Lucas. <laughs> we had a question from Lucas earlier, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, so if I find the question again, it was mostly about like, uh, what do you think are the main challenges currently when you consider legacy systems, when you have to go from no API culture to a, a real time infrastructure, right? To RTI, so. Yeah, I think in, a, in a, like a real legacy architecture, one of the hugest problems is the, uh, existing frameworks that are uh, implemented, right? So we see a lot of uh, Windows shops that are running .NET frameworks. Um, and we have ability to scale. Um, and I think a huge initial move is to the move to service-oriented architecture or microservices architecture and trying to adopt a more concurrent model, right? Where you're trying to uh, serve your APIs as concurrent um, um, and more uh, scalable, right? Uh, but the nice thing is that uh, tools like Nginx reverse proxies can help solve a lot of those pain, pains and also give you the ability to do that slowly and more effectively because you can sit a reverse proxy in front of your existing legacy applications and do what's called facade routing. So the clients have no idea what's going on behind the API infrastructure if you have the ability to do HTTP level um, uh, routing and traffic shaping. So First recommendation would be to first initially get something like reverse pro proxy in place to do facade routing and help you with the scaling on the back end. Um, and that'll allow you to break up your existing monolithic applications. Yeah, Mike on your side, uh, how do you see this change of culture from no API culture to real time APIs, right? What, what company needs to, to put in place? Yeah, I, I, I think actually Kevin nailed it uh, pretty well. <clears throat> Uh, a lot of times it's what you have today that kind of slows you down or sort of stands in your way. And it's not just the technical elements, but it's also socially how we've done things, uh, how, how long we've taken to build things and the kinds of tools and frameworks that we've built up. So I think Kevin's uh, got a great start. There's a, there's, a, there's a talk I do on what's called the star treatment for stabilizing, transforming, and uh, uh, adding and repeating. And the very first step is exactly what Kevin talks about, which is this facade routing is the first step. Decouple 
the actual request management from your back end, and then you can start to move in small ways to actually you know, revitalize and transform each step along the way. And then you're going to need to do some of the same things. So really, you know, Kevin has just shown us the start of what's possible with tools like Nginx just for caching, but there are so many other things about security and routing and authentication and, and clustering that, that you have to put in place as well. But that very first step is super important. So I think that's, that's a really good start, which is you wanna build a culture, not just of, of real time, but a culture of, of small intervals. Like, let's do one thing. Let's just get the facade up and let's get that working. Then let's try to build a single service and so on and so forth. So I think it's just starting from there and moving on. So for the last three minutes, we have uh, two questions. What's the difference in the approach for API performance monitoring when your services are running in the cloud or on-premises? In cloud right. versus on-premises API performance. You want to take that, Kev? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, choosing your tooling right. Um, you know, you, surprisingly, when you move to a cloud uh, provider, things can get more complicated. You can actually find yourself going through more loops than you're expecting or even aware of. Um, you, I always call this the noisy neighbor syndrome uh, and also the, uh, the cloud services uh, you're, you're sharing resources with other people um, and you're kind of unaware with what tools and uh, uh, capabilities that they're using to route that traffic. So uh, trying to get as much control of your tooling in a cloud provider is really the key to success, I think, uh, because you don't want to rely on cloud uh, load balancing or cloud services because a lot of times that you don't have control to monitor and access those. And so I think a huge part of, again, uh, if you're trying to do a multi-cloud or um, uh, on-prem and uh, cloud solution is pick your tooling and try to keep the environments as similar as possible. Not yeah, sure if you have so one last question from... Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Now, one last question in the last minute we have from Xaba Salat. Uh, is it true that Nginx as a reverse proxy is slow on Linux? Like, with the .NET, with the .NET, .NET Core, uh, someone mentioned it in a tweet. And is it true? And if yes, do you, how do you plan to fix it? Or if it's not true? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so Nginx doesn't serve .NET Core um, in any way. So I'm not sure um, how, how that would relate. Um, it's possible maybe, then maybe they're talking about units, Nginx unit, which is- As a reverse proxy. Server. As reverse proxy, the question is, as a reverse proxy. Yeah, no, Nginx just so the, does, the, it, yeah, it just talks to HTTP. So there shouldn't be any issues with that. If anything, it will help improve performance. So you can see the question. So uh, may, maybe the question is, is that true that Nginx as a reverse proxy is not playing nice with .NET Core? Slow, David Slower mentioned in a tweet on Linux. And if it's true, yeah. So Nginx to Kerstrel to .NET Core. Yeah, I I would say that's not true. Yep. So not not familiar with anything with uh, with that as an issue. Or yeah. So Xaba, so that's, thank you. So we've achieved our uh, full hour. Uh, so that was I think really compelling. Uh, so I think most of the people stayed the whole time. So um, it seems the content were what was uh, expected. Uh, we would want to thank every uh, attendee, uh, right? And thanks for also the people asking questions. Also, we thank the panelists, right? And we thank uh, um, it, uh, Nginx, right, to, to, to support that webinar. And uh, yeah, you, you will be able to find, if you register to ask to, for the slides and the video, you will receive them by email. If you did not accept that at registration, you can still uh, request that from us by sending us an email. Uh, the, the, the slides and the, the, the video will be available on epicene.io on a specific page dedicated to that for replays. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, uh, see you at next webinar on at next uh, API conferences. So long, thanks. Bye, bye guys. Bye everybody. <laughs>